Welcome to the Westport Library. Today's program will begin momentarily. Supported by Verso Studios, created locally and shared with the world. Welcome everybody to the library today to celebrate Dick Rao and his fabulous exhibit, A Botanical Retrospective. <laughs> it's been a long time in the making. When I first met Dick, I visited his home, and it was sometime, I think, in late 2019 when we started planning this show. And I got to see where he worked, and I was fascinated by all the specimens, the sketches, the larger-than-life paintings and drawings that were taped and stacked and hanging everywhere that I looked. I left that day wondering how we would fit it all. Turned out, we had plenty of time to figure it out because COVID intervened, as you know, and everything got put on hold. So since we couldn't have an in-person exhibit, in the summer of 2020, Miggs and I Zoomed an episode of our virtual art series called Artists in Residences with Dick, which turned out to be pretty easy since at age 95 then, I think, uh, Dick had also pivoted from in-person teaching to virtual. The video has over 650 views, by the way, on YouTube. In making the video, we learned how Dick came to botanical painting after a 50-year career in motion picture special effects. We also found out that he always loved to draw and took his sketchbooks everywhere he went. And we learned that what started out as a suggestion by his wife to take an illustration class at the New York Botanic Gardens as something he could do in retirement turned into a certificate course in botanical illustration, followed by a master's degree, and eventually in his late 70s to a PhD in plant sciences, all of which resulted in a full-blown second career as an award-winning botanical artist and teacher, as well as poet and author. His book, Science Behind Flowers, the science behind flowers is literally flying off the shelves, and I know a lot of you bought it today. And I hope you've also had a chance to read the poems that accompany some of the watercolors in the gallery, because they are as beautiful and thought-provoking as the paintings. It took a long time to get here, but I hope it was worth it. <laughs> so before I turn this over to Migs, I'd like to thank the library's amazing art committee uh, for helping with everything from transporting and hanging the artwork to pouring wine today, and to um, Kerry and David and Travis for making this presentation happen, and to uh, David Rao and Deep Valley Road for the beautiful music accompaniment, and of course Migs our um, always engaging interviewer. And last but not least, I, want, I was hoping everybody could join me. On Tuesday is Dick's 98th birthday, and we all want to celebrate. <laughs> We could even sing. <laughs> well, I won't sing, but you could sing. Happy Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you, Dick. Um, before we get into your work, I just want to give a little backstory of how we became acquainted, I think. Um, several years ago, um, we were both wearing a lot less clothing in the pool at the YMCA. <laughs> and uh, you, I swam, and you'd be in there with a bunch of ladies uh, doing aqua fitness with Patty Condub, who I believe is here. 
it's Patty's here, right? Um, so not only are you a celebrated artist, but I, I understand that you're about to become sort of a movie star. There's a documentary that was made about the aqua fitness class called Below Surface. And it's about the aqua fitness class, but you are pretty much the featured player. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, you had said, and maybe this ties in with your artwork, you had said it's not just um, the aqua fitness wasn't just uh, physical, but it was uh, spiritual or soulful. How do, you want to talk about that and maybe how it relates to your work? Oh, fine. Yes. Microphone up oh, there? Oh, yep. it's, there on, it's on, it's on. Yeah, just, no, it's on. Just, is it on? Yeah. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Okay, great. Yes, um, the why has become part of my life, as it has uh, Migs uh, for these years. And, and what I see here are layers of my life. Um, thank you all so much for making my day because of you. Well, uh, our interview with Artists in Residence uh, was amazing. We got to see close up how you work and your palette and, and your inspiration. And I was, t some, I was telling some people how almost childlike you got in, in talking about your work. And I'm wondering, we're going to see some of it, if you want to know if you want to advance a slide. But what, how do, why do plants affect you that way? Or how did they, well, uh, plants, um, plants came fairly late, although I've drawn all my life. And we, uh, we had dear friends who were teachers in the system here. And we would go on um, holidays in the Caribbean. And they would sit on the beach, play cribbage, and I would take my sketchbook and go out and draw. And so I, I've always drawn, and I've drawn, I don't know whether I have, um, I have some, some early stuff. A lot of that was black and white. I used pen and ink, um, although I did watercolors too. But let's see, kind there of, there was a time when, when I got really involved, I think in the, that's, that's 74 over there, uh, in the 70s in drawing um, barns, just wherever I was. There was something to draw. And uh, when, when, when traveling, um, I, I would draw these. This is, a, this is Zagreb in Yugoslavia. Uh, part, of, part of, again, part of, a part of my life because I was, um, uh, I was an an, 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 in the animation field, not an animator. But I did work for them, and I belonged at one point to a... Um, an international animation association, which had their meetings in Zagreb and Europe. And, and so when I wasn't at the meetings, I was drawing. Um, this is very typical of what I've been doing. I, I have maybe 50, 60 different tree drawings, because those have always, I mean, what a marvelous structure. That is. Oh, with a, what, 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 how great a tree is. And, and this is part of my life. Not just drawing, but drawing nature and what nature presents for us. This is a world up here, among other things. This is early watercolor. Oh, no, you know, you know, you know a little bit stylized. Oh, that is probably a mountain on Mount Desert Island. I think that was, that's where that came from. And then, oh, okay, can I, should I just keep talking? I, I mean, I you see, I have such sure. difficulty. <laughs> um, what happened and how I got into flowers in the first place and oh, was the fact that my wife, who, who, God bless her, managed to lead me into wonderful areas 
that, that, I, that kept with me the rest of my life. She, uh, I was about to retire from business. And I was, I didn't, I don't play golf. I play a lousy game of bridge. And I was, look, what am I going to do for the next, my next life, my next, uh, and she said, you know, she was taking a flower arranging course at the New York Botanical Garden. And she said, you know, they're just starting a program in botanical illustration. Maybe you'd be interested. Interested? Look at me. <laughs> this is like, what? 93? 50 years later? <laughs> That's what happens, I think. That's what I've always felt, that what you do in life so often starts with some a, a, a choice that you have no idea where it's going to lead you. But this has led me to an area which keeps my days filled, which makes me very happy. So what happened was when I when I started going there, I started doing illustrations for some of the um, scientists there. And I suddenly realized that I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. <laughs> so I decided at that point to maybe go back to school. This was, I, I graduated college in 47. This was now in the, in, in, in the 80s. And I had not been in a classroom for those years. And so I signed up for a graduate program. There weren't very many available. Um, I could have, uh, 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 stores had, had one. Um, Yale had, has a uh, courses in environmental studies. And, and I, so I ended up back in New York at Lehman College where the Columbia, you know, the Columbia faculty in Buckley had moved because Columbia gave up their botany. So I, I ended up with wonderful teachers. And, and this opened out a whole new world. Because now, not only did I was able to look at flowers, but also able to understand what was going on behind them, what made them go. You, you, well, that brings up actually the question I had, because you see, you know, there are technicians that can draw anything and make, you know, they can draw, I mean, there's medical illustrators and yeah. botanical illustrators, but um, you seem, you also seem to be a storyteller. It sounds, do you consider yourself a storyteller? Because some of your plan, the drawings about, uh, you know, what I, in, the, in the interview we did, you know, for the library, you talk about I don't know, how the seeds get to where they go and how they evolve and how they bloom. Well, you know, I, I'm a, the problem is I'm a pedant. And so I want everybody to know the kind of things I know. And so when I paint, there is a story behind almost every painting that I do. Let's see what, shows, what I've got on some more. Oh, yeah. these are just, cla no, I'm sorry, just pages from sketchbook. But even here, uh, oh, these are my thesis. This is my th part, some of my drawing from my thesis, because I ended up first, you know, who knew it? I ended up with a doctorate in 2001 <laughs> at the age of 75. It was nuts. Uh, okay. Well, and you teach, now you teach at the, Botanical, you teach? Yeah. The well, botanical teach, gardens, yeah. correct? Uh, yeah. So, so after, after I had kind of gone to the garden and taken the scientific end of it, I, I then, then ended up with, with my doctorate. And, and then what did I do? I forgot completely about my doctorate. But I continued to teach. And at the garden, I taught the science, basically, this, the, what's called plant morphology, which is the side of science that artists, all my students were artists, and they were learning from that. You know, so that's, I had that background. Uh, and, and here's your book, by the way. Yeah. The well, science that came, behind flowers. That came later. This is, I've been teaching at, at the garden since 94. 
and I still teach at the garden. But I reached a, a point a few years ago where I said, you know, I'm not going to be around to teach very much longer. And I think what I do and what I know and what I give to my students is important. And so I decided to put it in a book. So this book is really designed for that one reason, to, for, for, for students. You know, for, and, yes, go ahead. So what, what, is, what is morphology? I could have looked it up. Okay. I wanted to hear okay. it from you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, morphology. <laughs> okay. Number one, 101 class. Okay. Morphology. What is morph? The f means form, form outside study. And ology is obviously study of. So I'm talking about the study of form. Um, anatomy in, in um, bot bot botany deals with what's going on inside, the cells and the tissue. But artists look at the outside. They look at what's there. And so it's important to know why is that? How many petals does that particular flower have? And why is that important? How are they arranged? How, why, why does a, a, a let's see, see, let's some see what I got here. Oh, perfect example. Wow. Here we go. What are flowers for in the first place? Why are they there? They're there for one reason. They're there to get the ovules, which are in the ovary, fertilized. They're advertising agencies. <laughs> They're there to tell, to, that's why they have beautiful colors, so they are white, so they stand out against a mass of green, so they attract the pollinators. And, and where are they, and, 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 and that's what's wonderful about flowers, I find, is the variety. You can't turn away, and find, you can't find, and you're looking and you find something new all the time, everything. Is, is there, but this guy here, for example, you have, the flowers are basically made up of four, four organs. The, uh, the sepals, which are the outside to protect, the petals, which are there to, to, to attract, but then there are male organs and female organs. The male organs have the pollen. Wait a minute. I'm <laughs> this is not a teaching class, but I got to do it. Anyway, <laughs> okay. So in this particular flower, how do they separate them? I mean, you know, this is one of the millions of questions that are asked. You don't want in flowers for the pollen to fertilize its own um, uh, uh, ovules. So therefore, they do all kinds of things. In this case, the ones that are lower, that are up or higher in this value, are the males, the, the, uh, the pollen holders, the stamens. But down here is where the receptive, it's not quite open yet, but that's where it's going to accept the pollen, but it's not, but it's not gonna do it in this one because they're in different places. Sometimes it's different times, sometimes. But, you know, that's what I get. Go for how much do, do the birds and bees have to do with making... Everything. Everything. Because this is all designed. Not for us. Beautiful flowers aren't there for us to enjoy. They are there for one reason. For the birds and the bees and the butterflies. And to, and to do different things with them. I don't paint a lot of flowers. What's happened in the world of botanical art in the last 20 years is phenomenal. There are people here who are much better than I am in terms of painting, and most of them paint flowers. So I've kind of edged out. I've kind of, I'm a coward. And so I look at another part of the floral, of the life cycle. Of, of plants, and I, so, I, and here's another one. Again, one of the few, this, this is the only, there's three flowers in the show, basically. And again, this is a different flower, this is witch hazel, fascinating flower. Oh. Which is one, isn't there one at the senior center, the witch hazel? Yes, exactly, piece? well, yeah. you'll see in a second, because this is before 
what happens at the senior center. And that's actually a print of that is on in the show. But basically, what, what happened? What if flowers are basically there to pollinate? But once the seeds are formed, the flower has another job because it can't move away. So it's got to depend on outside sources for seed dispersal. And that's what this kind of stuff is about. And this is, of course, <laughs> this is what I have been involved in in the last, you know, 20, 30 years, 40 years. Because it, first of all, I don't have so much competition. <laughs> Secondly, the, the, these are what's known as dry fruits, dry fruit. Fruits are the plant's answer to the question of seed dispersal. And they come in many forms. But a whole group of those are known as dry fruits. And you know what? They don't, sh they don't need color. They don't need size. They'd have to, uh, they, most of them uh, use wind or, or kind of, or, or sometimes uh, clo clothing or animal fur to get there to, to distribute the seeds. This guy, what you're seeing here is a kind of a capsule. Inside is black and shiny. Those are where the seeds were. And this, like so many other kind of plants, builds up gas when, when it's closed and tight. When the seeds are, are ready to be dispersed, it opens up and they burst out. It's amazing, you know. So this is a little off the wall question. Do you think plants have, there are people that do believe the plants have feelings? Do you think they no, have feelings? No, I'm sorry, I no, don't. You're not I'm one not of those. one of those. <laughs> I, know. I, I want you all to have feelings about plants, <laughs> but I don't think. <laughs> do they, we interviewed somebody last time that dealt with vines and she worked with actually her exhibits out in the hallway there at the library, Tina Puckett. And she said the, that the vine spoke to her in terms of what to do with them, like what to do with, you know, mold me, bend me, whatever. I mean, do, they, do they speak to you? Let's yeah. say. Well, I, again, that's, that's what I do in yeah. a certain, I do it graphically. Right. But I think, a, a knowledge, and this is what I'm here for. I want you guys to look at plants in a different way. And what, what uh, Mace is talking about is somebody who's able to look at a plant and know whether it needs water or doesn't need water, or whether it, so you can do that. It is that, that's interpretation, I think, of a plant. In, your, in our interview, the video, the Zoom interview last two years ago, um, we had a brief, David was videotaping us and showed your, you have a microscope, a very sophisticated microscope. Yeah. So is that just to get into the details that the human eye can't really see? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I'll tell you something. I have a microscope sitting on my desk and I don't use it anymore. The old cell phone camera <laughs> is an amazing tool. I use that if it's, if you, and it, it depends. You've got to get a sh razor sharp image. But if you get a razor sharp image, you can transfer it to your computer. You can move in on that detail. It's better than any microscope. Yeah. Really? Okay. Could you know, yeah. You can sell it on eBay or something. Um, so they teach as a, do they teach calligraphy in your in your doctorate? You have such great handwriting. I assume that's your own handwriting oh, there. Yeah. Well, again, I have belonged to a number of different groups: uh, the American Society of Botanical Artists, um, the Guild of Natural Science Illustrated. Wonderful. Yeah. And they have get-togethers every year. And one year, I took a class in calligraphy from one of the people. And me, basically, it's, 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 I have a thing I kind of copy, but, I, but it's, it, it's, it's in pencil. <laughs> you can erase it and create your own work. But, but that's why, I'm not, wait a minute, I'm not 
Something's happened. I'm not advancing. Help! <laughs> Well, we could talk. Again, this so we is get... what happens. All the, I teach mostly on Zoom these days, and if you don't think this happens a lot, you know, wait a minute. We're going to see. Yeah. Try, there no. you go. Wait a minute. One more. Try oh, there here go. it is. Okay. This is my third contribution to painting flowers. This is basically the flower of the oak tree. My, my, the guy that the, my helpers to provide me with this material were the squirrels. They cut it down and they let it, and here it was in my driveway. But here's a whole different world of flowers. Here's a different way that fl the plants decide how to, how to handle the difference between the pollen giver and the, and the pollen taker, if you will. And there are separate flowers. Those things hanging down are the male flowers. And in, this, and in, the, in the oak and many of our deciduous trees, both of these exist in the same tree. They're called monoecious. And the, and the female flowers are in the axle of the leaves, the young leaves. And of course, they look like tiny acorns because that's what they're going to develop into. But that's a yeah. you talk in, in some interviews, you talk about the architecture of plants. And so yeah. what, what is that? How do you, well, you know, we know architecture is buildings and... Yeah, buildings. How, how they're, well, they're all, uh, let me see if this one is not a great example of that. Oh, but this one maybe is. How did, uh, this, look at, this is this big. It's, it's a roadside weed, but look at how it's constructed. Look at how, how they eat. Now, the brown one in the center is, is known as an akeen. It's where, it's fruit. It's where the seeds are. But look at how they build those wings around it. it looks like little hearts. Gorgeous. But you never, you would throw, you put that in your compost pile if you haven't even noticed it. But it's, that's why I'm here. To let you know that this kind of stuff happened. You know, they, you know the, the expression, oh, stop and smell the roses, you're saying, you know, stop and look at the roses. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. Okay, all right, this is, this is a devil, right? This is the uh, uh, fruiting body of a dandelion. It's gorgeous. Is it scratchboard? How is it done? How is this hmm. done? Is this a drawing or is it scratchboard? It looks this like is scratchboard. Okay. Yeah. In other words, what happened? The black is on a kind of a surface that you can dig in, almost like clay, and you coat it with black. And all the artwork is done with a needle rather than with a pen. Revealing the white underneath. Revealing yeah. the white below. Now, I had this up here for a reason, because along with painting, I have been writing poetry. And now I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm inspired and I've produced, as you've seen, if you're like, uh, what they call chapbooks. Chapbooks made of my uh, illustrations and then, you know, some, you know, some poetry that's okay, some that's not so, some kind of funny, some, but I've kind of con converted both. Do you happen to? Have the, 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 they don't have No, it. I didn't. Well, anyway. Printed. It's in the, it's in it, the gallery. It, it, this, if you look on the wall in my show, the poem, but what I really was saying in this poem, that if you could think of this, not as a distributor of seeds for weed you don't want, but a piece of sculpture, how gorgeous it is, if somebody, how would they have made this? Uh, nature makes it out of silk and air and creates this globe. So I moved not just by the science sometimes, but by the beauty of this. 
and how it appeals to me in that area. It could be a crystal chandelier or something. Exactly, right. exactly. Where do the samples come from? These aren't all indigenous. I mean, some of these plants aren't found in your backyard. Where, no. where do they come oh, from? Well, a number of, I have a group of dear friends that know what I love to paint. And so they see something and immediately, oh, Dick would like that one. And I, again, my wife was marvelous. She was an agent. She would go out and look at all over the place to see what, 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 what I would love to draw. And they were, and they were always right. <laughs> my daughter-in-law is marvelous that way. She's a gardener. And so she brings stuff to me. Uh, well, look at all this. Look at this elegant. Look at this, how gorgeous this thing is. It's a lotus. It's, it's actually uh, the, uh, the uh, what was the pistol of a Logan. The, the, the seeds are actually, they're not, they're fruit. They're actually nuts that are through. But, but as a graphic element, how could you, how could you outdo that? <laughs> So you went, I think you said, or I'm paraphrasing, that, that yeah. nature is an escape for you. Yes, right. An, an escape from what do you from what? Oh, well, that's of course a very important part of my life. I keep busy these days, always. I mean, I'm I'm that kind of a guy anyway. But more and more important to me now is that I find solace and beauty and, and you know, confirmation in nature, in what goes on. There's order there. There's reason for everything that's done. There's economy. And so I am, I find my way out of this mess we live in as human beings who can't control that the, uh, the 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 meanness and the and the and greed and and and, and you know cruelty that is rife so I escape I escape in nature I escape by keeping my days filled with painting and with teaching otherwise I wouldn't be here and you allow us to escape into Thanks. your work. <laughs> oh, wait, let, me, let me move back. Okay. Oh, no. This is the. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I just want a brief comment about this because it's. Uh, this is. Uh, it's not photographic necessarily in in its total, you know, precise, pristine detail, but it's got a soft focus. It's got a what they you know in photography, it's depth of field, usually. Yeah, artists draw everything in perfect focus. If it's in the back, in the front, everything is crystal clear. And this, why don't you explain okay. it a little better? Oh, all right, sure. <laughs> well, this is the very first piece that is in the show. First piece in terms of time. It was painted in, I think, 93. And it's loose. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's wet on wet, which is a technique or watercolor. And of course, I, in doing it that way, as, as Mig says, I can show the variety of, of focus. And I've gotten out of that. And so my latest works are much more specific. There's no out of focus. This is, um, it's called dry, it's, it's hard edge painting. And it's basically, uh, a dry brush watercolor, dry, not completely dry, but I use washes and something, but I finish up with very, very dry. I apply my paint very, very dry. Yeah. Why in this particular case, why are they called honesty capsules? Okay, you know? again, oh, oh, you really want me? <laughs> okay, what I, what, what, um, again, here's what I'm asking you to do, look, at this kind of stuff and see what I see. Look at, these are, these are fruits. They're called, you know, silica, which doesn't mean anything. But basically what it is, 
is a three-parted capsule. And it's like a sandwich. Each disc is the outer two round discs uh, keep, and then in the center there's something called a replum. And that replum is where the seeds rest. And on the ones that are kind of brownish, if you look, you can see the, they're translucent, so you can sort of see the seeds are flat or dark and round. But what happens here is that those valves fall off, as do the seed. And look what we have left, this beautiful thing called lunaria, which comes from honesty or silver dollar for dried flower arrangement. It's amazing. It's gorgeous. And I, I, I don't, I'm, no, no, I, I'm not going to tell you why or how, but that's what I'm talking about here. Okay, let's see. Here's another one. Morning glory. This terrible curse that kind of takes over. This is what the fruit, which you never, can, you throw, of course, if you want the seeds, the seeds are those black things in the bottom there. But, if, but it's the same kind of process. But look at the difference. It's the same thing. The outer valve falls off. In this case, there's three of these things in each one of these things equally spaced. And they're separated by what's now called a septum, but it's the same kind of material as, the, as we just saw in the lunaria. Can you see it in this one down here? It's kind of shiny in there. It's exactly, look at what, again, what nature does, makes connections, uses stuff over and over again. Phenomenal. Well, <laughs> uh, well, this is a, a cynical question that I'm asking on behalf of anybody that might be thinking this. Why not just take a photograph? What, what does this, why not a photograph? What does the illustration well, present? I, I, and and I don't answer that question anymore because I've just bought a beautiful book on, on uh, seeds and pods, which are all photographs, and they're gorgeous. And, and what's happened in photography, it rivals what I do in a certain sense now, because they have something called stacked photography, which allows a photographer to take a picture that is in sharp focus all the way through. And they're gorgeous. Yeah, but you're, I asked it because- But I am looking at it. It's me. Well, that's it. Somehow, that's, that, that even though I be as, as literal as I can be, I hope what you're seeing there is a reflection of what I see, not just what a camera sees. Exactly, that's yeah. what I'm glad you said. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about connections. My, my, again, my daughter-in-law presented me with this wasp nest, this paper. Can you, again, think about this thing. Wasps make paper. Beautiful. They made paper long before the Chinese thought about it. <laughs> and they, con they construct a home. But look at what happens, and this one's kind of been damaged a little bit, which makes it more appeal to me. But look at those, you know, those ridges, as they've done it, the ridges, the repetitive lines that are beautiful. Well, you see that in many things in nature. It isn't just here. Have you ever looked at a, 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 some of the bracket fungus? It has that same repetitive thing. Um, I don't know what else I have here. Oh, yeah, here it is. There's a painting of, of uh, a, a, you call it a, a turkey tail. And again, the same kind of beautiful repetitive lines showing age, showing how the growth happened. Uh, so that's, that's, again, if you look, look. That's what I, look what happens at the end of life. Look what nature gives us. 
to admire. They can be beauty, even at the very, very end. And there's a hint of what was, so yeah. it's all there. Yeah, again, that, you know, what you're seeing, a network of veins, this is, this is, well, okay. it's, a, it's a certain kind of, I don't know what I have the other one. No, but there again, look. Look at that repetitive, those lines that, uh, you know, again, appeal to me, that nature gives us to look at. Gorgeous. Again, thanks to my daughter-in-law, who, who says, ah, he'll like that. He'll do something with that. Where does she find these, on the beach? Where do you find driftwood? Well, she, again, she's a, she's a gardener. Oh, okay. And these are probably found in, in, you know, in, among the dead leaves and stuff like that. And they're not right. big. Oh, okay. Well, that's... Look. Here it is. Think... This is another one. But it's this is the kind of stuff. But even that, and of course, <laughs> I can't help to compare this kind of stuff with me. <laughs> Not that I'm beautiful or anything, <laughs> but I'm useful, I'm functioning. And so age doesn't mean destroy doesn't mean oh, the, yeah. and the lines you know if you want to relate to see yes, the lines give line. a character yes you know, exactly. the lines of this without those lines it's just it's not just a only shape. that but a can be the home the source the the nutrition for other growth forms for lichens for mosses as this painting which is the painting the last painting in terms of time in my show. And I guess it's the last painting. Thank you <laughs> for, for all this, right? Well, well, I think we've just enough time for some questions. So we're, uh, if anybody wants to, they have to go to the microphone. Is that what we want them to do? So be recorded or you'll find the person. Does any questions for, for Dick? And there's Patty. Hi, Dick. <laughs> There's your teacher. <laughs> uh, how do you know when you're done with a uh, painting or a drawing? How do you know when you're finished? And also, is it for sale? Oh, oh, oh. right. Okay. They'll trade for swim lessons, I think. These are, these are all oh, my paintings, basically, as I started, I said uh, maybe a while ago. They're all enlarged. Part of the reason I paint enlarged is because I'm old. And it's so much easier for me to paint bigger. But also, it gives me a chance to show you what I find. The architecture is what makes it, the, the beauty in these things that you, don't, that you cast away. I want you to look. That's why I'm here, as I say. And are they for sale? Are there prints for sale? Are they originals oh, yeah. for sale? The, the paintings are all for sale here, and, and I and I it, I loved for you to have them. I'm not. I, what am I going to do? Take them with me? <laughs> so I want not only that, but if these are too pricey for you, I can make prints, color prints, which are beautiful. And I can't tell. They're on watercolor paper. And they are now, I mean, I, uh, they're, they're available. I can get them made, made for you. They're called fine art prints. Uh, and they are uh, you know, just, uh, I can't tell very, myself when I look at the original and a print, which think, is which. I think we have another question. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was going to ask if you make lithographs of them and we're, we're selling them. Um, if you sign them and number them, the lithographs. Okay, the you prints. Have, yeah, wonder, did, do you sign and number the prints when you make a print for somebody? Yes, I yeah. I do. Unfortunately, so there are three prints on this in the show which I did not do that with. They got framed before I had a chance. But yes, normally I do, and I it's a limited. I never make more than twenty four of these. Uh, so that, again, you're getting something of value, not just something I'm going to make thousands of. 
or anybody else, I hope. Yeah. I think there's a couple of more. Hi, Dick. If you can, would you recite one of your poems? No, I can't. I, <laughs> I tell you what, um, my chat, I didn't, I didn't bring it. I was supposed to bring it. I, yeah, my, yeah, yeah. I um, forgot to I'm bring. sorry, but they're all in the chat books that are there. I didn't bring any here. To, but basically what I do is I use uh, my paintings as a prompt. And again, some, some of them I say are, are pretty silly. <laughs> Other ones are more heartfelt. No, the one about the dandelion is in the, um, is in the gallery. It's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Poem. Uh, There's another question okay. coming up. Here. Dick. Yes. Watercolor is a wild child. Very hard to control sometimes. And I look at your paintings like the wasp's nest, and I look at this one. And I wonder how you could control the painting so that the white doesn't get lost. How do you do that? With care. <laughs> but basically, how I pr approach any painting. I had a marvelous teacher, a gal named Anne Marie Evans. Oh, we can. Oh, I don't know which one the dandelion. Okay, we can, we do you know which book it's in? Okay. But basically, how I do this, first of all, I draw it very carefully. Then I enlarge it using grid and get it onto watercolor paper. The first thing I do is I do a wash. This is not dry, but a wash of the lightest color of, that, of any area. So it kind of breaks the surface of the paper. It allows me to do a hard edge thing. And then I draw, I work with dry brush, pretty, pretty slowly, very carefully. So my, the white is the white of the paper showing through. I, I do not use opaque white over, because I, it's, never, it's never worked for me. It gets muddy, it gets kind of, it doesn't sparkle. So that it, you have to take care. It's a slow process. It's a process where, you know, you just, I mean, some of these things take weeks to, to finish. And again, I, I uh, what I tend to do is, is kind of give the, um, the, you know, try to get the form, now, now this is another part. The surface is what's so interesting for me, the texture of the surface. However, each object has a form. And so you can't lose that. You've got to show the, you know, generally speaking, a light coming from the upper, upper left and create a form. So this kind of has a roundness. And then I work into that. So even the lights in the sun, the dark areas are not light. They're not, they're gray. But yes, I, the, I, I leave this, I don't have a, but even so, those rims, so, so they, they were left. I painted inside and outside to leave the white tough going. Yeah. We found the dandelion need... poem. Do you want to oh, read oh, it? Yeah. Or do you oh, want... well, go ahead. Do you want to read it? I don't know if I can do it justice, but. Well, oh, yeah, yeah. see this with my eyes, the eyes of childhood, when I first caught sight of tempting magic orbs bobbing in the lawn, begging to be plucked, and with such tender care brought to my lips so that a gentle breath would send each wisp alight. Look at it not as a curse spreading unwanted weeds, but as miraculous, efficient tool for doing just what it was meant to do, disperse a seed and thus ensure new life. In my wildest dream, could I conceive of making something so superbly right and beautiful to look at as an afterthought, a globe created out of air by bursts of silver hairs. I pretend that I was seeing this not in my lawn, but in a sculpture show. I could but help to be impressed by ingenuity of the design, by delicacy of parts, by architecture absolutely fit. I asked the medium the sculptor used, just air or light or gossamer. This sphere of fraught fragility appeals to my need to understand, to put on paper transience to catch the instant just before it flings its spawn, 
not on the secret breath of child, but on the business of a breeze. <laughs> I can't follow that. Um, oh, another question, okay. Hi, Dick. Uh, thank Hi. you so much. I met you at a Fern Club meeting with Yona about 20 years ago, and I've never forgotten you. I oh. appreciate you a lot. I, I just am wondering, from watching Yona do the type of work that, that you do, it's so, things look so different as you get closer and closer and closer, and then you back off a little bit. And I'm just wondering what, what it is that tells you, I'm going to paint it from here. I'm not going to paint it from here. I'm not going to paint it from there. Like, this is where I stop and do, and do my thing. That's the hardest thing in the world, knowing when to stop, for me. But I do, I think it's because I find in detail the, the you know, well, that's what I was talking about before. First of all, to create the form before, you know, and, this is, and that's another very hard thing for me to do. Once I put the, with this, these T-tones, this light wash in, the next thing I try to do is go to the darkest area so that it gives it an overall form, so that it's a cylinder or a bowl or whatever it is. Then I feel safe in putting the detail. So that's, I think that's probably what you, you know, I try very hard um, to make the details work. And that's why, you know, you can come close in and it's still, hand, and that's kind of, that's happened to the, the whole story of botanical art in the last 50, 30 years in this country. The artists have become proficient in making it work right up to the very tiniest part and so that it works on every level. I'm not the only one by any means of doing this. There are people in this room, uh, who are my colleagues and painters, who are very eloquent in terms of creating that kind of feeling. That's what it's, you know, it's very literal. And so you have to take it on that basis. I paint what I see, pretty much. I think we have room, we have time for one more. If there is one more, otherwise, there's up front here. It's wonderful, I know everybody that's asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> if they get out of line, boy, I think they're gonna be trouble. <laughs> so, I, Dick, I just know from my own observation of flowers and the like, that the appearance of things can be shaped significantly by the light that you apply to them. So do you experiment with how the, how you um, set these things up to paint with the, with the light so that maybe there's shadow, maybe there's not? Uh, do you use light to, to help you shape the, the Absolutely. I use something called an art light. And an art light is tuned to daylight. And I also have a kind of a shadow box that I set my work up in. And I definitely do try to get a light coming from that upper, you know, it's, it's not an actual law, but it's a kind of a rule to, to help form that. So yes, to a certain extent, these things I set up to make them work for me, yes. All right, well, I think that's it. And uh, there's a naturalist uh, who wrote a poem and the first lines are, the lesson which life always repeats is to look under your feet. And I think you are asking us to do that. Right. Look under your feet at leaves and grass, at right. whatever, and all around, because there's beauty there, right? But it's rich. It's there for you until we destroy it, mm. <laughs> which I'm right. scared well, well. to hell about. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>